Good morning, everybody. I want to talk to you today about Pangea and how the idea that the continents fit together kind of gave life to an historical perspective on a unifying theme in geology. But first, let's kind of review a few things. So let's pretend you have a, this um, molten pot of lead and you're going to take a solid piece of lead and drop it. Is it going to sink or float? Why? Well, obviously, with most things on the earth, the solid version or the solid state of matter of that um, particular thing will sink because solids are normally, not all the time, but normally um, denser than their liquid counterparts. So in the case of lead, the solid lead will sink in the molten lead because the solid lead is more dense. Number two, Number two, will one of our compasses work in the southern hemisphere? Why or why not? Well, a compass always points north. So even if you're in the southern hemisphere, north is still north. And magnetic north is still magnetic north. And so, of course, it's still going to point that way. But that is a question that a lot of kids have. Number three, name something that is not considered matter. I think we've discussed this earlier. Um, light is not made up of matter. Heat is not made up of matter, even though it takes matter to generate heat. So, but those are two things that are not considered matter, light and heat because that's energy. Number four, can you get liquid water any hotter than 100 degrees Celsius at standard temperature? Explain. Well, we're going to work on this in lab on Monday, so I'd rather not give that one away just yet. Number five, if one gram of liquid water freezes to form one gram of ice, why does ice float? So this was something that some of you were really having difficulty with. The reason ice floats is because if you think about um, the molecules of water, let me, let me see if I can just draw this real quick. So you have, um, we have a, oxygen in the middle and whoops hold on just a second and then we've got hydrogen atoms on either side of it so there's our nice liquid water however when you get to right around in for whatever reason, four degrees Celsius, and it begins the process of freezing, that molecule kind of spreads itself out. And so it takes up slightly more room. The oxygen and the hydrogen kind of just you know the hydrogen kind of distance themselves a little bit from the oxygen they're not just hanging to the side now not very much not very much at all but just enough so that solid ice floats in water and so that was the reason that ice floats the volume increases in water molecules they spread out and so some of you had it backwards. You said that they become tighter in a solid. That is true for everything else or virtually everything else on earth. 
except water. So I did want to um, make that point clear. All right, so this brings me to the story I want to talk to you or tell you about today. And it all starts with a man named Alfred Wegener, who was German, which is why we say his name like that. And Alfred had a degree in astronomy, but he was a meteorologist. And he makes lots of observations, he makes connections about his version of the earth. He observes so many things that others have also observed. For example, he notices that the pieces, uh, or I'm sorry, that the continents look like pieces of a puzzle that you could put back together. He makes connections between fossils and the continents and how, how in the world could they possibly exist um, in their current locations? And in 1912, he proposes the idea of continental drift. Now, there were some misconceptions. He had an observation of coastline that often was credited only to Wegener. People thought that only Alfred had discovered that. And that's not true. People began talking about um, the continents of the earth looking like a jigsaw puzzle clear back in the 1620s. Um, Frank Francis Bacon was the first one um, who published that the coastlines of Africa and South America fit together. And he was an author, not a scientist. And so it isn't that um, Alfred Wegener discovered that, but he took it a little bit further. So let's talk about this hypothesis of his, continental drift. So basically we had these two basic premises. Number one, the continents were once a single landmass. In other words, all the continents had fit together at one point. And that the land masses must move by kind of plowing their way through the ocean floor in order to get to their current locations. Well, can we build a single land mass? If we use modern day continents, we could try. But what are the problems with this? So, first of all, the evidence. Let's take a look at the evidence. And they do have this jigsaw puzzle fit. However, they the, the structures on different continents also seem to fit together. For example, um, the Appalachian Mountains kind of fit together with a, um, oh, the name just flew out of my head, but they have a sister mountain range that fit together in Africa. Also, if we take a look at ancient rock sequences, if we were to drill down through the crust and bring those rocks back to the surface, we would see that many of those rock sequences match other um, other continents perfectly. We also have fossil evidence and we have glacial grooves. So those are the five key pieces of evidence for having Pangea. All right, so we've got good evidence. Let's take a look at it one piece at a time. So Wegener recognizes this past observation that, you know, the coastlines seem to fit together. But he begins to observe other similarities. He begins to observe similar structures 
on different continents. Mountain ranges appear to be similar. Mountain ranges match up on other continents. He also begins to see that ancient rock sequences match up. For example, we have similar cratons. We have younger orogenic belts. And if you take a look at what we're looking at right now, South America and Africa, you'll see that it does fit together. It's not just the fact that they look like puzzle pieces. It's the fact that they have very similar rock sequences. Different living species. Yes. So right now we have different animals and plants that exist on these other continents, but they have similar fossil species. For example, Mesosaurus. Whoops. Lystrosaurus. Glossopterus, which is a plant fossil. Now, take a look at this. I want you to see the different um, colored belts there. Those indicate where the fossils are found. Okay, so we have um, South America fossils. We have Africa, India, Antarctica. And we have South America, India, Antarctica, and Australia. All of these things, you know, if you're finding fossils that are very similar um, in Antarctica as they are in Africa, they couldn't have stayed in the exact same location that they are today. Would you have um, the type of plants that are the same type of plants in Antarctica that you would in tropical places like um, parts of Africa? And glacial grooves. When a glacier goes over rock, it actually polishes it and it kind of carves it down. That's how heavy glaciers are. And so if we take a look at places where glaciers existed, we also see, hey, th these match up. That means that the continents couldn't just be in the same places that they are today. And these are just maps showing you of where the glacial grooves um, are and what direction that they moved. However, with all of that evidence, that hypothesis did not become a theory. So why not? Well, I, I want you to think about back um, over a hundred years ago, people were still very, very fixated on a, um, that the earth was formed the way it was formed by God and that it was formed in its natural state. So to have continents moving, that just was too much, too incredible. Um, scientific snobbery. After all, this guy was a meteorologist. Why in the world should we listen to him? You know, what does he know about the earth? And how could the continents move? What would make them move? He couldn't answer that. But the biggest reason that his hypothesis did not become a theory is lies in this question, what force could push the continents? He had absolutely no answer. What could move giant slabs of earth? hundreds, thousands of miles from the positions that they're in today. We had no idea back then what would cause um, plates to move. So 
if we were in class right now, we would, I would have given you uh, puzzle pieces and let you reconstruct Pangea. And we would have taken a look at your earthquake maps as well so that we could start to see how the earth really is made. And speaking of your earthquake maps, did you guys notice patterns? These are the places that most earthquakes occur. That lit, lit up part that you're seeing, those are earthquakes. These are earthquakes um, by magnitude since 1898. So can you imagine if I'd ask you to do two weeks worth, let alone a, over a hundred years worth? So what you'll notice is that the earth is broken up into plates and earthquakes happen at the boundaries of those plates. So let's test this hypothesis. What do we have? We have evidence for Africa and South America connection. And if you take a look at that right now, you will see, let me get my pencil back out. I want you to look here. This is one of the largest mountain chains in the world. And yet it's in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, so how did we discover this? Well, it wasn't until World War II that we even knew that that existed. And what happened was they were using sonar mapping of the sea floor by the Navy and they found the Mid-Atlantic Ridge. Well, that's amazing. And the reason it is amazing is because of what they found at the ridge. Because remember, we've already rejected um, Alfred Wegener's theory. This poor man died trying to provide us with evidence to support his idea that the continents were all joined together. And we have to wait for a world war for us to discover this. So we're taking a closer look right now at these mid-ocean ridges. All right, and what you're seeing right now on the screen is kind of a close-up drawing of one. And at the mid-ocean ridge, you have some volcanism, but it's not like a normal volcano that you might think of at this point. It is volcanoes, because, or I'm sorry, magma coming up in between these two plates and these two plates are going in opposite directions they are pulling apart from each other and where they are pulling up whoops where they are pulling apart we have down in this area we have magma rising up through the cracks and the crust that are left behind as it pulls so what does that form it forms brand new crust. So at the mid-ocean ridges, we have volcanism, we have new crust being formed, and that's all over the globe that we find these things, that we find these mid-ocean ridges. So scientists had to do more testing. And this is what they found that the crust was moving like you can see right here um that the crust was moving in different directions we call that diverging or divergent boundary and 
there was a rising um magma coming from the mantle of the earth and we have two parts of the mantle the lithosphere and the asthenosphere and the lithosphere is it's cooler it's rockier but it's still part of the mantle and then right below that you have the asthenosphere which is a little bit more molten not quite molten we refer to it as plastic not plastic like a toy but it's like a solid that behaves as a liquid that's what we mean and this generated the seafloor spreading hypothesis the fellow that was um, known for this is Harry Hess. He was a geologist that worked with the um, U.S. Navy. So the Atlantic Ocean was getting wider, but scientists were like, wait a minute, the Earth isn't getting bigger, so what's going on? Well, <coughs> excuse me, we have to take a look at a few more pieces of evidence before we get there so we have two other scientists vine and matthews and they drag a um, magnetometer across the ocean floor and guess what they find they discover magnetic reversals in the crust so what does that mean? Well, if we take a look over here, the green sections are normal polarity. The North Pole is where it is today. The South Pole is where it is today. We're, we're gonna to refer to that as normal polarity. But guess what? During parts of uh, the formation of the ocean floor there are also these other sections and they are labeled in like that pinkish color on this model and um, those sections have reverse polarity that means that the North Pole was at the South Pole the South Pole was at the North Pole now does that mean that the world flipped upside down absolutely not it simply means that the magnetism of the poles were reversed. So how does that play into our theory of plate tectonics? Because like I said, continental drift, that is not a theory. That was just an idea, but it did lead us to some good things. And this theory of plate tectonics really and truly uniform or uh, unifies the whole um the whole field of geology so what is the theory so you have the lithosphere and the lithosphere is divided into a series of plates you know the crust and these plates interact with each other they cause earthquakes volcanoes they build mountains there's a creation of new lithosphere, new crust. Let's take a look at these drawings. And so we have oceanic crust. Uh, let me find a color that you can see. So we have o oceanic crust. And it is the dark crust right here. So this dark crust is oceanic. It is more dense than continental crust. Isn't that crazy? Because when you think about a continent, those are huge. But continental crust is anywhere from 12 to 45 miles thick. But it is less dense. Therefore, therefore it kind of rides a little bit higher um, than oceanic crust.
So what causes these plates to move? Well, we have two different mechanisms for plate moval. That is convection cells in the mantle and slab pull plate push. So a convection cell, that's the heat that results from the residual formation of the earth, or the, I'm sorry, the residual heat from the formation of the earth. Um, it's kind of leftover heat. But what else? We also have radioactive decay <clears throat> from radioactive elements that are in the mantle and in the core. What is slab pull plate push? Well, density causes a plate to sink beneath a colliding plate. Now, will a continental plate ever sink below an oceanic plate? No, oceanic plates are always more dense. So <clears throat> only oceanic plates sink back into, <coughs> excuse me, sink back into um, the top of the mantle. Sorry, lost my train of thought. And as new crust is created at plate margins, it also pushes the plate away. So you have one end of the crust sinking and you have the other edge of the crust being pushed. So if we had to look at a drawing of convection, I want you to think about, um, I don't know, cooking a pot of chicken noodle soup. And we put the pot of water, like right here, on our stove and I have a gas stove so I've got a nice little flame right there and as the flame heats the water remember heat rises so you've got heat heated water rising up on both sides heated water rising up and then it cools up here on top well, and the cool water sinks. And it kind of creates a little um, rolling inside the water. And if you've ever watched chicken noodle soup being cooked, you will notice that as the water begins to boil, the noodles roll around in the pot. Well, that is from a convection cell or a convection current. You'll hear them called both things. And inside the earth, you've got um, different heat going on throughout the mantle, causing the um, other parts of the mantle, you know, the upper parts, to begin to turn just like that chicken noodle soup, except the plates are the crust are over top of those convection currents so they kind of ride along it's like a conveyor belt it would be like if i sprinkled i don't know pepper on the top of the water of the chicken noodle soup and the pepper was the crust of the earth you would see the pepper move across the top the same thing with the crust of the earth it helps move those convection cells move it move the crust along the top of the earth. And then this is a better picture of thinking about um, the crust and the convection cells within the asthenosphere or that lower mantle. Here, we, I want you to also take a look. We have tension forces tension forces force continents apart or i'm sorry not continents they force plates apart and we have compressional forces compression the plates are coming together we also refer to those as convergent um, boundaries 
whereas tensional forces, we think of those as divergent boundaries. So let's get a better look at what slab pull would be. When I think about slab pull, I picture if you've ever accidentally left a towel on the side of the bathtub and one little edge gets into the water, your whole towel will end up falling into your bathtub water. Well, why? Well, it gets heavy. Same thing here. You see the edge of the slab of um, plate, um, and that would be oceanic plate because it's the one sinking. Well, as that plate moves down into the earth, it kind of pulls the rest of the plate with it. Now, this happens not quickly. Okay, I don't, whoops. I don't want you to think about this happening all at once. It doesn't happen in the same um, in the same way that your towel falls into the bathtub. This happens centimeters at a time over the course of years. Okay, and so this happens at about the same rate your fingernails grow. Plate push. This happens. <clears throat> at those oceanic ridges and you have those tensional forces pushing the plates apart so plate push is where new crust is forming and that new crust as it bubbles up oozes up in between the two plates pushes its you know pushes those plates apart again it happens at the same rate that your fingernails grow. That's kind of a good idea for you to keep in mind when we're talking about this. Doesn't happen fast. Just a few centimeters a year. Sometimes a little bit faster. Not much. So, um, I don't want you to do this. You can ignore this for right now so let me help you ignore it what i do want you to do is on um monday we are going to meet in lab our labs are always um split between the noon group and the one o'clock group always in fact unless i tell you otherwise we're always going to be split up <clears throat> The only time that is not true is for, um, usually I'll have you all together to review for a test. And that is all for today. And like I said, I hope that everybody is able to be back with us on Monday. I hate that so many of you are still um, not able to join us because of COVID restrictions and uh, like I said, I really hope that um, I will, I'll tell you what, I will bring your lab sheets for Monday. We will be doing the Changing States of Mind lab. So be ready. You guys are going to be boiling, melting ice and boiling water. Take care, guys, and I'll see you then.